of Legends Relentless Revenge probably won't go down as the best set of all time, unlike its predecessor, Battles of Legends Light Revenge, and you know what? That's okay. While Light's Revenge did have amazing cards like Minerva the Exalted, Light Sworn as a reprint, Cyframe Lord Omega as a reprint, and Anti Spro Fragrance as a reprint, as well as Double Evolution Pill making its appearance inside of the set, Battle of the Legends Relentless Revenge probably has some of the dankest, and when I mean dankest, best upgrade reprints of all time. It would take numerous amount of new OTS packs to catch up to what Relentless Revenge has done. And I'm going to be showing you guys why this set is so good, or why you should be picking up this set. I'm the Cali Effect, and if you guys want to see more videos like this, then go and destroy that subscribe button. But more importantly, hit that notification bell, because, well, we just too strong. If you guys are having a bit of problem seeing some of my videos, then you actually might have to hit the notification bell and then click on always that way you guys get to see every single one of my posts all of my videos i also want to take a shout out or a time to shout out every single one of my patreons without you guys these videos would not be probable i really appreciate you guys and helping out the content without further ado i present to you you know right that's that battle of legends relentless revenge set review Battles of Legends is a huge 105 card set. So I'm gonna be breaking it down a little bit different. The first thing we're gonna be talking about is the rarity upgrade or reprint cards that are secret rare, rarity upgrade or reprint cards that are ultra rare. Then we're gonna be talking about the awesome new cards that are secret rare and ultra rare alike for you guys that want to go to a specific, I'm sorry, for you guys that want to go to a specific part of my video, then go ahead and check down below in the description that will take you to a certain part. So start Starting off with those rarity upgrades, Monster Reborn as a secret rare. That is freaking awesome. We've had Monster Reborn as a common, we've had Monster Reborn as a shatter foil, and an ultra rare, but never as a secret rare, if I can recall. We've also had it as a super rare, so it'd be pretty awesome to have a new highest rarity Monster Reborn. I think the pretty big question is, will we get the Lost Art Monster Reborn? I doubt it. Or will we get a secret or regular version of Monster Reborn? I really think that we're going to be getting a secret or regular version because, I mean, Lost Art is for Lost Art. Next card that will be reprinted in secret rare is Card Trooper. Now, you guys might think, Cali Effect, why'd you even put this? Because I'm not going to be mentioning every single reprint. I'm going to be mentioning the very important ones. Now, Card Trooper is really important because this card was actually once a very competitive card and still has the ability to be a competitive card. I advise you guys to pick this card up as a secret rare before it is too late. I'm just really feeling Troop Dupe Scoop. We have Machine Duplication at three. We have Card Trooper at three. The only thing we need is a way to search both of those cards and Troop Dupe Scoop is alive again. I'm just a firm believer in Card Trooper um, as a card that you guys should be looking into. Another card that we have, we're going to start off with the Phantom Knights cards. The Phantom Knights Ancient Cloak is now printed as a super rare or a secret rare as well as the Phantom Knight Silent Boots. This will be their highest rarity print. Another card that people should be looking out for because these cards are awesome. Phantom Knights cards are going to be getting more support inside of a three uh, deck uh, box set, kind of like what we have with the Legendary Dragons, and we got uh, Mega Fleet Dragon, the new Dark Magician card, as well as the new Odd Eyes cards. Phantom Knights is going to be part of a warrior-like theme box set, so you guys might want to pick up these Phantom Knights before it is too late, before they skyrocket in price, because Phantom Knights are, well, too strong. Next, another card that we're going to be talking about with a secret rare reprint is Supreme King Dragon Dark War. My boy finally got another print. Excited to see him. Was really waiting on, on him to get an OTS print, but a secret rare print inside of the Bat Battles of Legends set is just really good. I can see all of these cards settling um, at the $5 range, to be honest. Um, Dark Worm being a $5 card, both the boots and the uh, other card, uh, gloves being maybe two one dollar cards uh depending on how phantom knights do inside of the meta so i really see those settling card trooper not being much and monster reborn that card is a wild card it can be anywhere between five dollars and fifteen dollars depending on the odds of you pulling it dark worm i think will be a solid five dollar secret rare inside of this set it's just a really really good card it's very powerful for pendulum based decks and even not for pendulum based decks it's just a really powerful card let's just put it that way um, next, Brilliant Fusion as a Seeker Rare. Bird, 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 bird. 
Get rid of your super rares before it is too late. The only brilliant fusions I should be seeing on a card table are secret rares and ultimate rares. No more super rare trash, mainly because the super rare will be a little bit harder to get as opposed to the secret rare and the ultimate rare will still be the highest, most sought after brilliant fusion. And they're not even that much. Brilliant fusion is at a point in time right now where it's not that an expensive card. So I would pick up these brilliant fusions before they're too late. I can see them debuting maybe at like $3 ish. Nobody really cares about this card they're trying to get into the blood the juice the guts the most important cards of the set so it might get looked over next the phantom knights fog blade as a secret rare so all of the phantom knight cards are all of the really good phantom knight cards have been reprinted as secret rares i would have loved to see um the other phantom knight trap cards i cannot remember their names right now it's two of them that were played inside of the phantom knight strategy i would have loved to see them get at least ultra rare prints not 100 sure if they did we'll find out if they did but um unfortunately they didn't get secret rare prints uh phantom knight's fog blade i can see is a two three dollar card depending on how well phantom knight's doing they haven't been doing great so it's like uh there's no real real need uh to pick them up immediately if they're too high merlin as a secret rare boy the guides or the yugi guides have answered us because merlin is probably one of the most trash cards that we've seen in that rarity i mean the only option that you guys had was to get that disgustingly nasty platinum rare like Ugh, that's nasty fortunately for us we are spared with a secret rare version of merlin don't expect this card to be too much because i mean it's noble knights unfortunately they haven't been doing good on the competitive circuit i of course i'm going to be looking for a set myself uh gam seal to sea turtle kaiju this will be another one of the highly sought after reprinted cards because now this replaces the super rare print as the highest rarity i can see this card actually being a 20 dollars chaser card depending on how well or how many times that this card is actually printed inside of the set so i really do like that gam seal got uh, another print and in secret rare print to add to that and it's really cool to finally have max rarity one of the kaijus because the other ones are still commons rares and supers Hmm. Didn't think about it like that. Next card we're going to be talking about is Dark Lord Ishul. So for the people that bought Destiny Soldiers, I think that's that set name, you literally have no reason to even buy that set. The set's completely trash now. For the exception of Vision Hero Vion, this set's complete ass. There's no return on your money. It's like a $40 set. And more often than not, when you open a box of that, even if you do pull the issue now, it's not worth anything because a secret print from Battles of Legends Relentless Revenge will probably be easier and cheaper and the same rarity. So it does not help uh, you Dark Lords players case. I guess it's a good thing because now Dark Lords players can now play Dark Lords a little easier. Next is Elemental Hero Honest Neos. Now this one hit me in the feels. I was begging on Honest Neos to be a really, really, really expensive card inside of the Duelist Saga set. A card that really drove the price up because guess what it's only in the duelist saga set this set doesn't print anymore and it was a pretty nice nine dollar card now with the new print it's going to be a three dollar seek or three dollar ultra rare probably even a cheaper secret once the secrets uh drop but i still will be picking these cards up not only because it's the highest rarity but because it's only still one two prints of it and relentless revenge ain't gonna last forever try to find those light revenge sets not that easy on to the next card, Metal Foes Mithrillium. Now, y'all can't say Mithrillium, bro. Not on this channel. We say Mithril, all right? And this card is so amazing. To be honest with you guys, just reading its card effects, just seriously, sit down and read it. You can target two Metal Foes cards in your graveyard and one card in the field. Shuffle targets into the graveyard into your deck, and if you do, the target monster on the field to the hand. You can only use the effect of Mithrillium once per turn. If this card is sent from the field to the graveyard, you can spell someone Metal Foes Pendulum Monster from your graveyard or, your, or face up from your extra that card busted i mean literally one of the best fusion monsters we have in the game and metal foes are highly underrated like stupid underrated this is a really good card awesome card to have printed as a secret rare tornado dragon excuse me tornado dragon getting reprinted as a secret rare is also an awesome card this was a 17 18 card for maximum crisis Right now, I think it's not even $10 right now, but it's very good. It's, it's a very powerful staple. I think that it should be accessible to everybody at least once a year uh, from its print. So I like this reprint. I really do a lot. Um, also, I think it confirms that we're not getting Tornado Dragon as a secret rare inside of the Megatons. Keep in mind, cards that have been reprinted inside of this set from last year, I highly doubt that they will be printed inside of the Megaton, so it's an awesome pickup for right now because in about a year's time they'll go right back up one or next well i'm saying one copy like it's a it's a deck profile next we're gonna be talking about is union 
hanger. So Konami makes me waste money on the supers. Right after I made the money on the commons, because the commons were expensive, you only can get them for the structure deck. And then they give me secret union hangers to compliment my secret ABC monsters. Like, I can't hate you, but I'm not loving you right now because you're making me drop money. Union hanger is gonna be a spectacular card. Pick these cards up. Everything that I'm showing you guys, you guys might wanna pick up, especially if it's stupid cheap. Next is gonna be Dragonic Diagram. Another reprint is out of this set. Another huge reprint. Um, I think that this card is a card that you guys definitely would like to pick up, especially if you don't have them. All time lows right now, the original prints are $10. So if you want those OGs, then pick them up. It's $30 for a set, never been that cheap ever before in its life. Diagrams used to be a $100 card. So imagine paying 30 on a, you know, 300 play set. That, that's just, damn, that hits me in the feels. I've had those diagrams for that long. The next and last reprint is probably the one that everybody's flipping out about. It's Trickstar Reincarnation. Now, I'm gonna cross my fingers and hope for you guys that this isn't gonna be one of those hard to pull secret rares, but the more I'm looking at Trickstar Reincarnation, Dragonic Diagram, and Tornado Dragon, yep, those seem like perfect candidates, you know, like Omega, like Minerva, to be hard to get secret rare reprints inside of the set, as well as not printing them inside of the Megatons. <sighs> Man, that's, that's gonna be pretty nasty. If you have your Trickstar Reincarnation, they're going for about 20 right now. That's not a bad time to get rid of them. But if my prediction is correct, expect Trickstar Reincarnation to go back up if they're not hit by the list and the deck continues to be popular. That is it for all of the super good secret rare reprints that got rarity upgrades or just reprints for us to get cards cheaper. Let's start talking about those ultra rares that receive the same treatment. All right, so on to the ultra rares. We're gonna start off with Noble Knight Madrot. Uh, the highest rarity would be Secret, so don't expect this card to be highly sought after unless you are a Noble Knight player still looking to get your copies of Madrot. And if you are doing that, getting Secret Rares might be the best idea to do it right here and right now before you have to resort to getting to ultra rares later on down the line. Noble Knight Brothers is gonna be a really important card to the Noble Knight strategy once they get to support quote quote you didn't hear it from me but if they do hey i just feel like they are especially since they're getting printed inside of this set just another great time for you guys to get secret rares while the ultra rares are being announced and when they first come out before it is too late and then you're going to be forced to get your ultra rares excuse me a little later into whenever you decide to get them if you decide to get them before it's too late one of the reprints that i'm excited for is yuna zombie oh my god been waiting for this card to get a reprint. I don't understand why it was anything less than super rare, but here we are with an ultra rare print inside of Battles of Legends. Uh, next is Dark Lord Nastin. Not really much else to say about this card, though it is uh, another card from uh, Destiny Soldiers that is reprinted, and this time it is ultra rare. Eater of Millions is another awesome card that was printed inside of a, or inside of a set as a common. Shouldn't have been a common, and now it's being redeemed as an ultra rare. And then on to the next, Full Metal Alchemist. Full Metal Alchemist. I'm sorry, if, you, if you've seen Full Metal Alchemist, then you kind of know how to cut scene. Whatever. Anyways, this card as an uh, Ultra Rare is also good. And again, Moto Tools are really good. This card can actually snatch an opponent's monster during either player's turn, but we're gonna talk about Metal Foes possibly in a deck profile a little later. Baguska, the terribly tired taper, is getting an ultra rare print inside of this set, so that's freaking awesome. Better than its super rare print. Don't see it as anything more than a couple of dollars. And to be honest with you guys, everything except for Eater or Millions and Unizombies are gonna be like, not really worth much cards. And then even Eater or Millions and Unizombies, I really don't see them more than $5. It's gonna be a really cheap set in the beginning, and then these cards could possibly go up depending on how play is seen. So Baguska is an ultra rare, that's awesome. I'm Duck World Chalice is an ultra rare, that's super. It's actually ultra, but still. Um, this card's really good. You know, World Chalice almost has everything blinged out. Herald, um, I'm Duck is just another great piece of the puzzle. Uh, Kyoto Waterfront. What I'm really disappointed is, is that they didn't print all of the Kaijus inside of this set. Would have been really nice to get ultra rare versions of the Kaijus, ultra rare Kyoto Router Front, and then a secret rare Gam Seal, but obviously they were having other plans. A side frame driver as an ultra rare. Fucking sauce, bro, sauce. Why are we getting all these great prints? Go well with your ultra rare Gammas. It's just really good. For frame age Trick Clown and Perform Age Damage Juggler. Now, if there were cards that were due for a high rarity reprint. These cards are due, being 
three years old and not having a high rarity reprint, but really pivotal cards into the format. Damage Juggler was banned for a reason, and Trick Clown is, I mean, it's just Trick Clown. It's good. Um, that's pretty good to have. Uh, Narito the Moral Leader, I don't think that this is the best, but it's not necessarily the worst of the prints. Um, it's still worth mentioning that Narito the Moral Leader has a Primo Gold print and a Secret Rare print, and that's really about it. So it having an Ultra Rare print, kind of hints towards spellcasters or at least i think it hints towards level six spellcasters being a little more relevant tg wonder magician oh my god cry your eyes out for everybody with ultra rare tg wonder magicians because they just got a reprint i think this is hinting that we'll be getting needle fiber very soon and why you know excuse me if i might frighten you guys but needle fighter as a 10 exclusive you heard it from me if you hurt if it does come out you heard it from the cali effect King of Games first. That would be too insane. It'd be kind of like Norden. Hmm. I think we're noticing a trend here. The next card we're going to be talking about is Cephalon the Time Lord. We're not really going to be talking about that other than it's a very old card that got a reprint set inside of a set that reprinted all of the Time Lords. So I don't even really understand why it's here. Not with the other Time Lord cards. Convert Contact, a very, very, very old card from Duelist Pack 6. Gets an Ultra Rare upgrade. Probably one of the most busted draw engines in the game until you realize that you have to play Neo Spatian. So, yeah. The next card is Neil Spatian Ground Mole as well as Neil Spatian Dark Panther. I think these are the only, I don't want to say it without being disrespectful to the Neil Spatian players, but both Dark Panther and uh, uh, Grand Mole are the two best Neil Spatian monsters. They've seen the most play in competitive circuits. Grand Mole being a very powerful card back in his day, and Dark Panther being extremely abusable. Rescue Cat back when Rescue Cat didn't negate the effect monsters, and also copying cards like Dark Arm Dragon was still really fun. Um, Pre-preparation of rights as an ultra rare, as well as preparation of rights of the ultra rare. Getting rid of all the supers, I think that this is freaking phenomenal. It's awesome to have upgrades of these cards as ultra rares. Can't wait for rituals to get more support and these cards to be a little bit more relevant. World Legacy's Heart as an Ultra Rare reprint. Oh my god, it was a common inside of the Code of the Duelist set, so having it as an Ultra Rare, pretty damn good. Solemn Judgment and Solemn Strike as Ultra Rare reprints. And I really don't really care about the Solemn Judgment Ultra Rare reprint, even though our Metal Raiders judgments shouldn't be affected. Kind of care about the Solemn Strike reprint. This is a card that I think you guys should pick up. Pick up as many copies as possible, especially if they're like two freaking bucks. Do it before it's too late, because a year from now, these Solemn Strikes will be like anti-spell fragrance, and they're going to be booming. Uh, and then the last card we're going to be talking about is Unending Nightmare as an Ultra Rare reprint. I actually pegged this card to be a lot better than what it is. It's a card that drifts kind of in and out of the competitive circuit. Not necessarily a great card, but a pretty decent and well-welcomed reprint i think that none of these cards that are, are every single one of these cards inside of this uh, this set battles of legends of relentless revenge won't be printed inside of the mega tens i think it would be really awesome allows konami to give us the more important cards and have two sets for ups to buy from if we want product from last year that is it for the most sought after or the best of the best when it comes to the reprinted cards now we can talk about those new cards in the set boy and we can start off with secret rares on to the secret rares i'm actually going to cover these secret rares that are more singular like cards and then the art types after i cover the ultra rares that are more singular like cards so we're going to be looking at hibernation dragon and it states if this card is normal or special summon you can target one level four or lower dragon monster in your graveyard add it to your hand during your main phase except the turn that this card was sent to the graveyard if you do not control a link monster you can banish this card from your graveyard then target one dark dragon link monster in your graveyard special summon it now this card's actually pretty damn good i'm actually really interested in seeing how this dark link dragon deck comes out because we've been getting a lot of link monsters that are dragon that require dragon monsters or link monsters that help out dragons so i'm really interested to see how this link dark dragon deck works out possibly a deck profile or something like that on it so triggering worm is the next card and it is a dragon effect monster and it says if this card is sent to the graveyard as a material for a link uh, summon of a dark link monster you can spell summon this card to a zone that that link monster points to an attack position but it cannot be used as link material if this card is destroyed or banished by a link monster's effect Draw one card, you can only activate the effect or use each effect of triggering worm once per turn. Again, another one of those dark dragon uh, support cards that are link support. And it's really interesting to see how that's gonna shape up. Really have to look into my archives and see how the other dark link monsters work and the other cards in general. Now going into topologic gambler dragon. This is a dark cybers 
Link monster. I thought it was gonna be a dark dragon. I'm like, oh my god, we in there. What this card requires is two effect monsters. And if this card is special summoned to a link to a zone, a link monster points to why this card is on the field, discard two random cards, up to two random cards. Your, then your opponent discards the same number of cards. If this card is extra link, you can make your opponent discard two cards or their entire hand if less than two. And then if they have no cards in their hand as a result, if like 3,000 damage to them, you can only use the effect of Topologic Gambler Dragon or Gumblar Dragon once per turn, only once that turn. Now, if there was ever an FTK card, this is the card. And I know it's a hard once per turn, but just the fact that extra linking is so easy and then inflicting 3,000 damage, I think that, that at the very worst, that card can come up in time. I don't think it's a really good card, ultimately, unless you play it in some really gimmicky deck. Fortunately, on to the next card, we're going to be getting uh, Viral Guard Dragon. It requires three plus monsters. It is a Dragon Dark Link monster. Oh, man, doing the Birdman hand rub for this card. Requires three plus effect monsters. Cannot be destroyed by card effects. I'm already liking it. Once per turn, you can send one card. Your... <clears throat> You can send one card from your opponent's spell and trap card zones to the graveyard. Special summon your monster. Special summon one monster from the graveyard that was destroyed and sent there this turn to your field, but it has its effects negated. Once per turn, you can target one monster on the field, change it to face up defense position. Your opponent cannot activate cards or effects in response to this card's activation. So basically, at least in my humble opinion, it is a Borolo Dragon. I don't keep up with the new anime, but if you ask me, it is the opposite of Borolo Dragon. Being able to uh, get rid of your opponent's uh, spell and trap cards. Um, and then special summon monsters to your side of the field as opposed to just snatching your opponent's monsters. Um, also, not being able to be destroyed by card effects, whereas Borlo Dragon can't be targeted by card effects. I think it's going to have a pretty niche role inside um, of the Yu-Gi-Oh card game. Not too expensive of a card, though, in my humble opinion. I think it's going to be maybe a 3 or $4 or $5 card. Not too expensive. Um, on to the next card. We're going to look at Flash Charge Dragon. Another Dark Dragon Link monsters. Oh, boy. Dark Dragon Links might be a deck. It has arrows pointing in every single position. I don't want them pointing in. It requires two plus dragon monsters. You cannot place monsters to a zone this card points to. Oh my God, it just became an even better card. It has all of the link arrows I wanted to point to for that effect. Uh, oh wait, no, you cannot place monster to a zone this card points to. Ah, huh. that sucks. Once per turn, when a monster is normal or special summoned to a zone this card points to, you can destroy one of them, and if you do inflict 500 damage to your opponent, when a spell or trap card or monster effect is activated targeting this card, you can tribute one monster to negate the activation. I think that this card is subpar. Then I started reading it, I was like, wait, I can't summon monsters to where it points to. My opponent still can. And then I can destroy one of them. Oh, okay, that's not bad, but it's a once per turn, and it gives me three arrows. So my opponent summons a monster that, like, can get rid of this card and i have to destroy it then they go off with their normal combo and just start summoning other cards i'm like uh i'm not i'm not a big fan of this card um but i guess it does have some protection inside of it it could be a little more problematic than it's leading on to be unfortunately this card just has to go in the extra monster zone um that's where you want to get its best use i mean hypothetically you can put it in the main monster zone after you link four or five million times because your extra monster zone all the way down back to, you know, your opponent's extra monster zone is a pretty big link. So I don't think that this card is that great. But again, at first view, it could be, or after first view, it could be a better card, depending on what other cards you're going to mix it with. Next is number 67, Hair of Dice Smasher. Oh my God. Card actually looks pretty cool. It is a rank five fairy monster. Looks like a fiend, but that might, you know, go into a part of its effect. Grab two level five monsters. Oh my God. Once return during your main phase, you can detach two, detach two materials from this card. Please don't say roll a six-sided dice. Please don't say roll a six-sided dice. Each player rolls a six-sided dice. God damn it! What the fuck? Twice. And the player with the higher roll cannot activate monster effects nor declare an attack until the end of the turn. Once return while this card has a, a material. If a player rolls a dice, you can treat one of those dice results as seven. What, what the fuck? Seven? Some cards don't even specify seven. I don't, I don't understand. Seven. This card's really gimmicky. I thought it was going to be a great rank five. Something that uh, rank five monsters are lacking. We're lacking a great generic rank five. I should have known it was going to be roll six-sided dice because it has dice in the card. But you could always hope for better, right? You can just, it's a part of the aesthetic or every single one of the dice rolls are pretty good. I don't know. Next is number seven to five, Bamboozling Gossip Shadow. 
I like this card. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna run around saying, hey, you've been bamboozled, swindled. Uh, it requires two level three monsters. Once per turn, when an opponent activates a monster effect, you can detach two materials from this card. The activated effect becomes each player draws one card. That's not terrible. That, that's not, it's not. Think about it. Your opponent's on the Judgment Dragon. They activate Judgment Dragon's effect. Nah, I think I'm gonna keep my board, but we can both draw a card. You know, not terrible. My opponent wants to use the effect of Trickstar Candina. Nah, I don't think you can surge, but I tell you what, we both can draw a card. Or even more pivotal, your opponent gets to that game state where it want to activate a really treacherous monster effect to disrupt you. Nah, I don't think that's how it's gonna happen. I think we both can draw a card. Not bad. Um, you can target one other number X seed monster you control, attach this card to it as material, transfer this card's materials to it. You can only use the effect of number 75 bamboozling Gossip Shadow once per turn. I actually do like this card's name because it, it fits into the name. It's like, oh, I'm gonna activate this card effect. Nah, homie, you've been bamboozled, you've been swindled, you've been swanked, you've been ganked. That's not what it does. It's gonna do this. We can both draw a card. I like this card. I don't know. I just like this card. Um, it actually, it actually works well with uh, Appropriate. I don't know, I mean, Appropriate's pretty gimmicky, but still, it, it's there. It's it's there. Next is gonna be number 27, Dreadnought, Dr wait, hold on, one more time. Let me look at this card. This actually works with Dark Worlds, like a Dark World Appropriate deck. That, that sounds gimmicky, but you know, it's not bad. Uh, number 27, Dreadnought, Dreadnoid. It requires two level four monsters. Um, I actually like the way it looks. If this card is destroyed, if this card destroyed an opponent's monster by battle, fuck. At the end of the battle phase, you can special summon from your deck one rank 10 or higher machine exceed monster by using this card as material. Huh. So it's a ship card that makes the railroad cards. And one of them, if I remember correctly, is really, really good. Unaffected by card effects by detaching the material. Huh. Okay. That's not bad. This is treated as an Exceed Summon. Transfer this card's materials to the summon monster. Oh, so now it's gonna have three materials instead of two. Oh, that's great. You can only use the effect of number 27 once per turn. If this card would be destroyed by battle, you can detach one material from this card instead. Uh, I think it's gonna be a pretty good upgrade to the, you know, train deck, even though it's not a trained card. Run a train on these hoes. Next is going to be number 90, Galaxy Eyes Photon Lord. They keep making galaxy cards and I keep getting uninspired. What it does is requires two level eight monsters. If the card has a photon as XE material, this card cannot be destroyed by card effects. Not bad. You can use the following effects of number 90 once per turn. When your opponent activates a monster effect, you can detach one material from this card, negate the effect, and then if the detached material was a galaxy card, destroy that card. I thought it was gonna be something awesome. And then if an, uh, you know, a detached card was a galaxy monster, you can take control of it or something. No, it, it's okay, it's not bad, it's not bad. But normally when you get negate the activation of the card effects, it automatically comes with the destroyed part. During your opponent's turn, you can take one photon or galaxy card from your deck and either add it to your hand or attach it to this card as material. Okay, that kind of makes up for the second effect, guys. Kind of makes up for it really well. I actually really like this card. I think it's a really good card. I think it's gonna fit in with the Photon strategy, well, only if they had a Link Monster and other support to keep up, because, uh, be real with you guys, the deck wasn't that great, and now it's going into a format where it's a little worse, because it's an XC based deck inside of the Link format. Hopefully, the new Photon cards we get will fix that problem. Next is gonna be Glorious Numbers. This card says, if you control no monsters, you can target one number XC monster in your graveyard, spell summon it, then draw one card. I like this card. You can banish this card from your graveyard, tar target one number XC monster you control, attach one card from your hand to his material. Why the fuck would I ever do that? You can only use the effect of glorious numbers once per turn. I do like the first effect. I think the second effect is gonna be more gimmicky. Like, it allows you to make all of those uh, number in whatever, the, the ones that needed a certain monster as material. No, because it only attaches from hand. I don't know what the hell we're doing. Maybe a Utopia, a Utopia deck still in, in play? I don't know. Um, next is gonna be Cyber Emergency. Our first Cyber Dragon support in a very long time. Add from your deck to your hand one Cyber Dragon Light Machine Monster that cannot be normal summoned or set. Hmm. No Cyber Dragon Light Machine Monsters come in mind that cannot be normal summoned and set. But, 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 I am not the Cyber Dragon God. I'll figure it out and I'll give you guys a deck profile soon. 
If this card activation is negated by an opponent and since the graveyard is a result, you can discard one card, add this card from your graveyard to your hand. You can only activate this card's effect once per turn. Now, there's something I actually want to uh, show with you guys is that you will be able to use this card's effect again, even though it says you can only activate the effect of Cyber Emergency once per turn. And I'm gonna give you guys a really good reason why. It says if this card's activation is negated, the activation is negated means that the, the activation never happened. You can activate this card again because the activation was negated. You still haven't fulfilled activating one cyber emergency once per turn. Now, that's the difference between when a card says activate as opposed to when a card says you can only use this effect once per turn. Um, to the next card we're going to be talking about is Living Fossil. So basically my wife. It is an equipped spell card. Activate this card by targeting one level four mo or lower monster in your graveyard. Special summon it and equip it with this card, but banish it when it leaves the field. When this card leaves the field, banish that monster. The equipped monster loses a thousand attack and defense and also has its effect negated. You can only activate one Living Fossil once per turn. I like it because in its equipped spell card, it has a little bit of potential. Some hidden potential that I necessarily don't see but definitely hidden potential. That's it for all of the secrets. Let's talk to you guys about those ultra rares and then we can talk about those archetypes, boy. Okay, I actually forgot a couple of secret rares. One is Iron Draw. If you control exactly two machine effect monsters and no other monsters, draw two cards. Also for the rest of the turn after this card resolves, you can only special summon monsters once. You can only activate one Iron Draw once per turn. Pretty good card for machines. Also, Orgoth the Relentless. Once per turn, roll a six sided dice three times then have this card gain attack and defense equal to the total roll times 100 until the end of your opponent's turn. If exactly two of the results were the same, apply the appropriate effect, or if all three results were the same, apply all of these effects. If you roll two, one, or twos, this card cannot be destroyed by battle or card effects until the end of your opponent's turn. If you roll three or fours, two, three, or fours, you get to draw two cards. If you roll two, five, or sixes, this card can attack directly. So um, not necessarily a great card, but still a really fun card. I, I see it being a pretty fun card to play. And that last is Flying Elephant, the most busted card in this set. What it does is the first time this card will be destroyed by an opponent's card effect, during each of your opponent's turns, it is not destroyed. During the end phase, if this card was applied, or if this effect was applied this turn and not negated, apply this effect during your next turn. When this card inflicts battle damage to your opponent by a direct attack, you win the duel. Okay, it's trash, but still, it's, it's a really fun card. Um, if you guys don't remember, Bandit Keith got scraped by this card by Maximilian Pelicuses, and now it's a real card. I mean, now it kind of explains um, how that win went down. So on to the Ultra Rares. We're going to talk about Kiaki, the Unity Star. If this card is special summon, you can pay 500 life points, fusion summon one warrior monster from your extra deck, using monsters from your hand or field as fusion material. During your opponent's turn, if you control a level five or higher warrior monster, whose current attack is different from its original attack, you can special summon this card from your graveyard. You can only use this effect once per turn. Um, pretty good for the Unity Star archetype. You follow up with Tandem of the Sky Star. If your opponent controls a monster or you control an earth monster, you can normal summon this card without tributing. If this card is normal summon or special summon, you can special summon one level five or one level five earth warrior monster from your hand. Really thought it was gonna say from the deck. I was like, oh my God, this deck's gonna be pretty fun to play. Um, you can only use the effect of Tenma Sky Star once per turn. Once per turn, when your opponent activates a card or effect that targets a warrior monster, you control, you can make this card lose exactly 500 attack. And if you do, negate the activation. And if you do that, destroy this card. So pretty powerful cards. I like the Sky Star archetype so far. Um, I, I remember correctly, Feast of the Wild might work with this deck really well. So it's going to be pretty fun to see how that pans out. Hayate the Earth Star, if your opponent controls a monster and you control a, or if you control a light monster, you can normal summon this card without tributing or... Or if this card is normal, summon a special summon, you can special summon level five uh, light warrior monster from your hand. You can only use the effect of Hayate once per turn. Once per turn, when a warrior monster you control is targeted from attack, you can make this card lose exactly 500 attack. And if you do negate the attack, kind of like how the battle guards are, it's going to be really interesting to see how this archetype shapes up. We only get uh, about, I want to say four cards for this archetype. So I'm kind of excited to see how they shape up. And it's going to be hard to summon these monsters at first, but I think people will find a way. Next is Shura Combat Star, and I actually have to talk about I Dayton before I talk about Shura. Let me go ahead and click on that and bring him out. And I Dayton requires two level five uh, or higher warriors. If this card is fusion summon, you can add one level five or a high, one level five warrior monster from your deck to your hand. You can only use the effect of I Dayton once per turn. Once per turn, you can discard any number of cards. This, game, this card gains 200 attack for each card discarded. I would never use that effect in my life. Well. Okay, I can see a combo with it. Once per battle, if this card battles an opponent's monster with an equal or lower level doing a damage calculation, you can make that monster's attack become zero. 
Okay, so it's an OTK type deck. Next is Shura the Combat Star. It requires one Idaten plus another level 5 or higher warrior monster. Once per turn during the battle phase, you can change the attack of all face-up monsters your opponent controls to zero. Once per battle, if two monsters battle during damage calculation, you can make each of those battling monsters gain attack equal to their own level. During that damage calculation only, if this fusion summon card is destroyed by an opponent's card or battle, by battle or card effect, you can send this card instant to your graveyard. You can special summon one Idaten the Conqueror Star from your extra deck, this is treated as a fusion summon. I think that this deck obviously won't be competitive, but it'll be pretty fun to mess around with. Possibly make something really stupid, really busted, and scrape some people for a video if you guys want. Next is Litimus the Doom Swordsman. You can ritual summon this card, one more ritual spell card. Or one ritual, or Litimus Doom Ritual, my apologies. Unaffected by trap effects. That is probably one of the most useless, unaffected, actually it is the most useless, unaffected, Unless it said, only affected by monster effects with a specific condition to make monsters affected by monster effects. That's probably the only more useless unaffected by monster effects that I can think of. Cannot be destroyed by battle. While this card, while there is a face-up trap card on the field against 3,000 attack and defense, great. It's not only is it tied to being ritual summon, I have to have a face-up trap card. I'm really hoping this trap card is going to be good. If this ritual summon card is destroyed by your opponent's card effect or battle, you can target one trap card in your graveyard, set it to your spell and trap card summon. Fuck, man, talk about mediocrity. Next is the Litimus Doom Ritual. It's not even a trap card that can be activated from hand as a ritual card. If this card, if this card is used for ritual summon, it's to use Litimus Doom Ritual. You must also tribute monsters from your hand or field whose levels are eight or more. Fuck, I actually have to ritual summon for this card. If this card is in your graveyard, you can target one Litimus of Doom or Swordsman of Doom Litimus in your graveyard. Shovel both this card and that target to the deck to draw one card. Nah, I'm just not going to play you. Uh, next is going to be Born in Draconis. Banish all light machine monsters from your graveyard and one face-up monster from your field. Special summon one level 6 or higher light machine monster from your hand, ignoring its summoning conditions. Oh shit, I can summon Cosmo Forerunner to my field. Oh man. And if you do, its attack and defense become the number of monsters banished to activate this card times 500. It is also unaffected by card effects, except for its own effects. You, can only, you cannot special summon other monsters the turn you activate this card. Well, it's a trap card, so hopefully I'm not summoning too many monsters on my opponent's turn. Um, it's a pretty decent card. I think that Cyber Dragons are going to gain some support. I'm still trying to figure out this level 6 or higher light machine monster in my hand that I will be playing with this deck. Other than Cyber Eltane. But Cyber Eltane is like, I don't know. Next, actually, that's pretty much it. So let's start talking about those, uh, the archetypes, which there's only two. There's the Castle Storm Fairy Tale like archetype, and then there's the Time Lord archetype. All right, guys, on to the next and last facet of this video. It's been an extremely long video. I hope you guys have enjoyed. Of course, I separated them, uh, you know, for the parts that you need. I started off with the Time Lord, Michium the Time Lord. It is a level 10 fairy fire monster. Its effect reads, excuse me, cannot be special summoned from the deck. If you control no monsters, you can normal summon this card without tributing. That's what all the Time Lords say, if I remember correctly. Cannot be destroyed by battle or card effects. Blah, blah, blah. You take no battle damage. I'm not going to read those effects because they're all the same. At the end of the battle phase, if this card battles, half your opponent's life points. Once per turn, do your standby phase shuffling into the deck. That is also another effect to all Time Lords. So this card is really effective when A, going into time into game three. Um, if you're like in your battle phase and they call time, you just go half your life points. Or if you know you're going to go into time within that game, summon this card off, get half your life points off, or your opponent's half your life points off, install with Michian. I think at the very worst, this card is going to be one of those side deckable cards people are going to try to use to stall into time. And at base, best, it might actually be a card to use for Time Lords. Now, if you were to play it in your Time Lords, I could only see you playing one copy if you were to main deck this card. Because half of your life points, half of your opponent's life points once, okay, that's big. You know, 4,000. That's kind of big. Having it twice, 2,000, mm, not too much. 1,000, what the fuck are you doing? 1,000, 500, 250. Yeah, this card's never going to be hitting for game. But still, just the fact that it can have the life points once isn't a bad thing. Next is going to be Helion, the Time Lord. And what this card says is, uh, if this card battle, if your light, current life points is lower than your opponent's, inflict differences affect damage to your opponent. What the fuck? So hold on. You give me a, a, a Time Lord that has my opponent life points, then you turn around and you just give me a better Time Lord that's just the damn burn card. What is wrong with you, Kamani? What are these Time Lords for? They seem like a burn stall deck. 
I'm, I'm, I'm very, very, very not interested in them. On to the next card, Rafi and the Time Lord. This card does uh, inflict effect damage to your opponent equal to the attack of one face of monster your opponent controls. Okay, so basically it looks like the Time Lords are going to be a stall burn deck. And this just might be the best Time Lord monster other than, you know, the disruptance we have with Safian um, and the Water Time Lord. I, I hope I'm saying these monsters right. Um, so I actually like this one. This might actually seem like a two or three of. Seems like a solid Time Lord card. Next is Gabrion the Time Lord. And as we look, these Time Lord monsters have zero attack. So we're going to need some way to get these Time Lord monsters attack. This card says, uh, if this card battled, shuffle all cards your opponent controls into the deck. Then your opponent draws the same number of cards. I don't like that part. I, I, don't, I don't like the draw the same number of cards, but I did like breaking your opponent's board for free. Um, I don't think that this one's a very good one because drawing your opponents, giving your opponent more resources after you've gotten rid of the resources, they might just make another busted board. Um, I don't know. Next is Sandy and the Time Lord. If this card battled, inflict 2,000 damage to your opponent. This is officially a burn deck. And Sandian is probably the best of the best Time Lords because it's not dependent on um, it's not dependent on other cards like the other Time Lords, and it gives you a definitive amount. Let's say you attack with your uh, where's that card? Your Mitchell, your Michion, and then you attack with Sandion twice. That's pretty much game. That seems like the thing. I think that this might be the three of Time Lord inside of the deck. Next is Infinite Light. Activate by only by sending one infinite machine in your spell and trap card zone to the graveyard. Cannot be destroyed by opponent's card effects and neither player can target Time Lord monsters you control with card effects. Also, they cannot be returned. Oh, what the fuck? They cannot be returned to the deck. Perfect. Once returned, if you control no monsters, you can special summon one Time Lord monster with different names up to one each from your hand and deck or graveyard, ignoring the summoning dishes. Summon one. If you control no monsters, you can special summon Time Lord monsters with different names, up to one each from your hand, deck, or graveyard. They have a busted trap. Good for them. Next is going to be Empty Machine. Once while this card is face up on the field, it cannot be destroyed by your opponent's card effects. Once per turn, you can activate one of these effects. Discard one level 10 monster, draw a card. That's good. If you control no monsters, if you control no other cards in your spell and trap card zones, target one Time Lord monster in your graveyard, shuffle into deck, then set one Infinite Machine from your hand or deck to your spell or trap cartel. That's that's pretty good. That That's pretty good. And they work off of each other. Oh, no, they don't. You need this one. Infinite Machine. Activate by sending one empty machine in your spell and trap card zone to the graveyard. Oh, my God. All right. So the third trap card makes perfect sense because the second trap card is the first trap card to be played. Bro, mind blow. Once per turn, this card cannot be destroyed by an opponent's card effect. Once per turn, you can activate one of these effects. During your main phase, you can special summon one Time Lord monster from your hand. Okay. Target one Time Lord monster in your graveyard, shuffle into the deck, then set one infinite light from your hand or deck to your spell and trap card zone. Oh my god, alright, this this isn't this this is um this is cool. It's cool. Time Lords are now a thing. The last thing that we're gonna be talking about is of course the fairy tale monsters. Really excited to reveal these cards to you. Uh Princessin or uh Cinderella. Is this Cinderella? The Glass Supper Girl Cinderella, right? Okay, cool. What this card does is if this card is normal summon a special summon, you can special summon one pumpkin carriage from your hand or deck. If Golden Castle Stormberg is on the field, you can equip one glass slippers from your deck to this card. You can only use the effect of Princess in once per turn. When this card inflicts battle damage to your opponent by a direct attack, it has 300 fucking attack. You can target one glass slipper equipped to this card and one other face up monster on the field, equip that glass slippers to that monster. Okay, so it looks like Princess is gonna be pretty much revolving around this glass slippers card. What does this glass slippers card do? If the equipped card is a fairy monster, it gains a thousand attack. Otherwise it cannot attack and it loses a thousand attack. Oh shit. So imagine fitting these shoes on one of your, I don't know, monsters such as, let me think, one of the most scariest monsters, Trickstar Candida. It's scary as hell. Okay, obviously that doesn't work. But fitting it on your Altergeist Hexia, or you know a monster, it's gonna lose a thousand attack and it's not gonna be destroyed by battle, but even more important, or it's not gonna be able to, uh, it loses a thousand attack and it can't attack. But even more importantly, imagine if this card was in the anime. Like obviously it was in the anime a couple of years ago, but imagine if it was in anime now and putting glass slippers on that card. Uh, if this card is sent to the graveyard because the equipped monster was destroyed, you can target one princess in you control, equip that, oh, okay. 
That's not bad. Okay, so Princess Sin and Glass Slippers work in tandem with each other because when Glass Slipper is sent to the graveyard, you can just equip it to the Princess Sin. And when Princess Sin inflicts damage or direct attack, you can equip the Glass Slippers to an opponent's monster and Glass Slippers gives your Princess Sin card effects. That's pretty cool. Next is gonna be Hextrude. I think this is the Wicked Witch. No, it's not the Wicked Witch. It's, it's the evil godmother. I don't know how that works. Um, if Golden Castle Stormborg is on your field, you can normal summon this card without tributing. That's kind of cool. Once Return of Gauss, Golden Castle Stormborg is on the field zone, you can target one card on the field, destroy it. And if you do, this card can make two attacks during each battle phase. When this card destroys a monster by battle, you can target one face-up card you control against 400 attack. I don't... I, I don't... It's not great. It, it's, it's okay. It's decent at first glance. Maybe there's a good way, a fast way to summon it. Gilf the Phantom Bird. You can discard this card, add one Golden Castle Stormberg. Sweet, a terraforming built inside of the deck. If this card is normal, summon a special summon, you can target one card in your opponent's spell and trap card zone, destroy it. You can only use the effect of Gilf Phantom Bird once per turn. I actually really like this card. I think it's really good. Next is going to be Golden Castle of Stormberg. Let's see what this card does. Once per turn during your standby phase, you must banish 10 cards from the top of your deck face down. This is not optional. What the fuck is going on? Your game will not last that long if you play this card. Shit. Fuck me. Oh my god. Banish 10 cards and it's not optional? You ain't got a choice? Well, you better get used to running 50 card decks or some shit. If this card is destroyed during your main phase, or, or this card, I'm sorry, or this card is destroyed. During your main phase, you can special summon one card that specifically lists Golden Castle Stormbirds in its text from your deck. Huh. Now, if I can prevent 10 cards being banished face down, that would be awesome. You cannot normal summon or set the turn you activate this effect. Not that bad. You can only use this card's effect once per turn. When your opponent monster declares an attack, destroy the attacking monster. And if you do, inflict damage to your opponent equal to half the attack the monster had on the field. Okay. This card's pretty cool. I, I, I'm really interested in building this deck because it seems fun. It doesn't seem good, but it seems fun. Next is going to be Iron Hans. I like this card because you can receive the Hans if you want to. My Hans are iron. I'm shaking my head. <laughs> if this card is normal summon, you can special summon Iron Knight from your deck. Also, if Golden Castle Stormberg is not on your field zone, you can is not on in the field zone. You can special summon monsters from the extra deck. Oh, you cannot special summon monsters from the extra deck for the rest of the turn. You can only use the effect of Iron Hans once per turn. If Golden Castle Stormberg is on the field, this card gains 1,000 attack for each Iron Knight you control, so it can be a 2,200 attack monster. Pretty cool. Next thing is Iron Knight, because in the daytime, it will be Iron Day. Get it? Get it? <laughs> it says, if you control an Iron Han, this card loses 1,000 attack. Garbo! If this card is destroyed a battle, or if this card is on the field... Oh, fuck, it's a level 4? Is Iron Han's a level 4? Ooh, okay, that's not bad. Oh, but you can't go on the extra deck unless you play the fucking Golden Castle. <laughs> Uh, or if this card on the field is sent to the graveyard, you can add one Iron Hans from your deck to your hand. If Golden Castle Stormberg is on the field, you can add one Warrior Monster from your deck to your hand instead. You can only use the effect of Iron Knight once per turn. Nah. Uh. Hmm. So far, they're not looking great, but it's looking really fun. Next is Iron Cage. When this card is activated, send one monster you control to the graveyard. Or if Golden Castle Stormberg is on the field, you can send one monster your opponent controls to the graveyard instead. Okay, that might be all worth it. Once per turn during your standby phase, you can target one monster in your graveyard that will sit there by this card's effect. Destroy this card. If you do special summon that monster to your field, you can only activate one iron cage per turn. I don't... So you get to kind of steal an opponent's monster? That's cool. And then the last card we're going to be talking about is Pumpkin Carriage, which is a plant level 3 monster. So it's a lone fire target. Princess and you control can attack directly. Your opponent cannot target Golden Castle Stormbird. You control card effects. Also, can, is it cannot be destroyed by card effects. So, to be honest with you guys, this deck is really, really bad. Like, it'll be fun, but it's bad. Bad isn't always fun, but this is fun and not bad. Now, thank you guys so much for watching another segment of the Cali Effect. I really hope you guys enjoyed this review. Let me know down below in the comment section what you guys are most excited for. But more importantly, your boy is going to have to take a break before I edit these videos. If I missed any cards, also be sure to put them down below in the comment section. I decided to, I tried to go over all of the important cards, which is why this video was so long. Please like, comment, subscribe, but most of all, enjoy. I hope you guys are having a great day, like I am. See you.
Stay classy, fellas.